Hello and welcome everyone to King's College London for the 2017 Education Lecture. It's really good to see that so many of you have come along to the Great Hall on this hot evening. My name is Sharon Gewertz and I'm Head of the School of Education, Communication and Society at King's which is hosting this event today. In a moment I'm going to pass over to our speaker Jonathan Friedland and after Jonathan there will be a short response from Christoph Meyer who is Professor of European and International Politics here at King's and then there'll be a, a discussion with the audience followed by drinks afterwards in the entrance hall. Before going in further, I just wanted to thank my school colleagues for organising this event. Jenny Driscoll, Sam Martin, Ben Day and Georgia Mella and the venue team here at the Great Hall. For anyone who is keen to tweet, the handle that's up there is at King's ECS and the hashtag is ECS, uh, ECS Lecture. I should also just say that someone is taking photographs of this event, so if you don't want to appear in any photographs, please just make yourself known to the photographer and, um, or let one of the team in red know. Um, just one more final piece of housekeeping before we get going. Uh, we're not expecting a fire drill today, so if the fire alarm sounds, it probably means there is a fire, in which case, the fire exit are the main entrance doors opposite these doors here and if you make your way to the Somerset House courtyard uh, that's the meeting point uh, but hopefully that won't happen. So tonight's lecture is entitled Post-Truth, Lies and Fake News. There's really no need for explanation for why we've chosen this theme. For those of us who work in universities we're relatively used to debating the nature of truth and worrying both about the dubious assertions of supposed truths and the lazy or inconvenient disregard for fact-checking or rigour. What's much more unusual is for these matters to become a central plank of political and popular debate, as they have in the right, light of many recent events, not least the Brexit referendum and the electoral success of Donald Trump. The cumulative effect of these changes and the associated truth-related controversies are for many people, I think, destabilizing and unnerving. More than ever, it seems we need wise commentators, both in universities and in public life more broadly, to help us navigate our way through these murky waters. And I'm very pleased that Jonathan has accepted the invitation to come to our rescue. Jonathan is one of the UK's foremost journalists He's best known as a columnist for The Guardian. He also writes for the Jewish Chronicle and the New York Review of Books. He's a presenter of The Long View on BBC Radio 4 and frequently appears as a TV and radio contributor. Some of you, but I feel not, uh, sure not all of you, will know that Jonathan writes thrillers under the name of Sam Bourne. So he has a professional interest in fiction as well as facts. <laughs> But he's above all one of our sharpest political commentators and someone who speaks about UK and international politics with equally impressive authority. We're very privileged to have him here tonight at King's and it gives me great pleasure to therefore invite Jonathan Friedland to give the 2017 King's College London Annual Education Lecture. It's a warm evening, I'm getting prepared. Thank you very much, Sharon, for that uh, very kind introduction and to all of you for coming out on, uh, on a hot evening when I know there will be other hotter uh, draws for your time. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here, um, given our theme especially in a place that uh, cherishes fact and learning. As, uh, as Sharon said in her introduction, I'm not an academic but a journalist. Sometimes these are treated as 
opposite categories, I know. Um, and I know that also, as a journalist, uh, in a way, one almost has to sort of step forward as if one is part of the problem rather than the solution in the manner of a sort of 12-step meeting. Uh, my name is Jonathan, and I'm a journalist, that kind of thing. Um, in this particular case, uh, I, I notice, you know, as I look uh, at the name uh, of the department or the school under whose aegis this lecture is, uh, a school of education, communication, and society. Well, I don't write about education, that's definitely true. But as a journalist, I am involved in communication. And a newspaper like The Guardian, where I work, is engaged every day in describing society. So I feel, as I look at education and society, in the words of that great scholar, Meatloaf, two out of three ain't bad. Um, the, the, the subject before us uh, is fake news and lies and post-truth. And I'm going to, uh, I hope, uh, wrestle with four uh, questions. The first is, what do these terms mean? Uh, what is fake news? How does it differ from post-truth? And, and how do both of those categories differ from lies? Um, then I want to wrestle with the question of why this has happened, that this has suddenly become, as we just heard there, a question that all of you as scholars were talking about before, but suddenly has entered into uh, the main bloodstream of the national and actually global conversation. Why has that happened? Uh, I then want to talk a little bit about why it matters at all, because in a way we can take that as red, but I think it's better if we don't, and so I want to talk about why it matters. And then finally, uh, uh, why, um, or rather what we can do about it, and particularly the role that uh, education, the media, uh, can, will have to play. So let's start off with what is fake news. And I want to do that by, in the spirit of scientific inquiry, given where we are, with, to uh, stage a little experiment with all of you, I'm afraid. Uh, it's only going to be show of hands. Don't worry, I'm not going to uh, engage in mortifying audience participation. Um, I'm going to mention three stories to you that were all big news stories in the course of 2016. Uh, all of them went viral on social media but, and, and, and within the mainstream media as well, uh, or discussed in the mainstream media, but only one of them is actually true. So I'm going to name three stories, uh, and I'll name them first, and then afterwards I want to show of hands for each three. I want you to raise your hand when, when I mention the true one, but I'll say them first. So the first story is that in the course of uh, 2016, and particularly in the course of the U.S. election, Pope Benedict, uh, indoor, Pope uh, Francis rather, Pope Francis, uh, endorsed Donald Trump for president. That's one of the three stories. The second story is that Hillary Clinton was at the center of a child sex ring that operated from the basement of a Washington, D.C. pizzeria. It's the second story. And the third story is that Donald Trump said he would be dating his daughter Ivanka if only he wasn't married. Those are the three stories. I'll go through them again, and this time I want you to raise your hand when you think you've heard the true one. So, for the Pope endorsing Donald Trump, no hands shown at all. Oh, there was one there, yeah, good, excellent. Second one is that Hillary Clinton was at the center of a child sex ring uh, operating from the basement of a pizza restaurant. We've got three, four hands for that one. And finally, that Donald Trump said he would be dating his daughter Ivanka if he wasn't married. <laughs> very good, this is clearly a very discerning crowd we have here. Um, I recommend you try this with your friends. It's a good social icebreaker, I tend to find. Um, and it also tells you quite a lot about your friends. So that is um, very, very useful. All three of those, uh, as I said, did uh, go viral. And the third one is the one that was true, uh, that Donald Trump did indeed say on television, there's videotape of it, uh, sitting next to his daughter Ivanka, that he would be dating her if it wasn't for the fact that he was married. And the other, the interviewer on the show, it was a, one of these shows of sort of morning daytime TV thing with multiple presenters. They looked so aghast that he suddenly realized what he was meant to say and then said, and of course, if I wasn't her father. <laughs> but there was this very uh, revealing delay before that particular penny dropped with him. Uh, so the, we've, we've done our little experiment. All, you know, two of those are very egregiously fake news. Uh, what, what do I mean by that? It's not just stories that are wrong, because stories that are wrong, uh, as any journalist will admit, I think, sometimes under pressure, but that happens all the time. Uh, the, the nature of journalism is the best account of what's going on that can be done in the time available, and that 
uh, that rider, that qualifier, is crucial, uh, you know, you don't have the time to absolutely uh, get, you know, get to the bottom of every single detail. The deadline comes, even in the era of online publishing. Uh, you know, in the old days when I started, it was always a print deadline around about now, and in fact, a slight sweatiness is entering into my palms, almost in a Pavlovian reflex, because now is the sort of old-fashioned deadline time. But uh, you have to get it as right as you can, and then you don't always get it right, and you make mistakes. And that's why The Guardian uh, was the first, actually, in Britain to initiate a reader's editor uh, to correct and clarify mistakes in print and online as soon as we know them. And P uh, any, you know, now it happens instantly in real time. If a piece goes up by me that includes something uh, wrong, in fact, there was one recently that included, it said that uh, it, it put the Nixon resignation in 1973. It should have been obviously 1974. And you know, somebody on Twitter said that's happened. Within two minutes, I'd emailed the news desk and they changed it. And so that's, that's just part of the deal. Instead, what we're talking about here are stories that are, in some ways, deliberately wrong, knowingly wrong, and where the, it's not just a detail, a date, it's the entire thing is made out of whole cloth. That's um, what we're, I think, talking about. Uh, it's a different category from just a normal, and I would say legitimate mistake. The interesting question is about, or rather, once we've got that sort of broad category, it then subdivides, I would say, into two further categories. One would be commercial uh, broadly, and another would be political. Uh, and that would, I would argue, would be determined a bit by intention and uh, motive. So there are stories, fake stories, that are planted for profit. Uh, and we'll come to those. And then there are ones that are done for purposes of propaganda. And I would say those are the two broad categories of fake news, wholly invented stories. Uh, the one about the Pope endorsing Trump, interestingly, began as one thing and sort of morphed into another. So it began on a website, which was is WTOE5, which apparently even in its um, sort of about us bit on the web page admits that it uh, is peddling fabricated stories. Um, it would do them in order that they would then go so viral that the way that the funding mechanism works online is that you know once you hit a certain number of clicks and click-throughs, there is a financial reward in terms of advertising. So they were really upfront that their motive was just to make stories up that went viral because they would get a profit from it. But it was and then rapidly picked up by a website called Ending the Fed, uh, which is believes the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States, is the center of sort of world evil. And they had set their face against Hillary Clinton and very much in favor of Donald Trump. And so they seized on this apparent uh, endorsement from His Holiness the Pope uh, and spread it. And it went uh, all round after that. Uh, the story, the other fake story we talked about, the notion of Hillary Clinton and the pizza restaurant, the origin of that is really interesting. Because again, it's sort of in a gray area between, having said there are these two categories of profit and propaganda, it sits in a gray area because its origin was in a website called 4chan, which some people here may know something about. It's a forum, really, an online forum. Uh, I'm going to engage now in a caricature, but its users are caricatured as young men living in their mum's basement, uh, on, you know, glued to their computers day and night who have got into, there's a whole other story which we haven't got time for about 4chan, which is fascinating. A kind of you know, nihilistic ideology has taken grip of that group in which uh, coming up with the most shocking, the most taboo-breaking stories or comments or reactions, uh, jokes even, is what they uh, do. And so, you know, some horrible story involving the, you know, a, an air accident and death of children, they will be the first online to make jokes about it, for example. They seized on this because of the WikiLeaks emails that um, the WikiLeaks release of emails from Hillary Clinton's team, the Democratic Party, the John Podesta emails, former chief of staff to President Clinton and a senior figure in the Hillary campaign. His emails, as you all know, were, were leaked. We can talk about where and who did that. Um, and then disseminated. And one of them referred at great length to arrangements about ordering pizza. And as a sort of joke, really, it started where the 4chan guy started imagining what pizza must be code for. It obviously can't really be about ordering pizza. It must be a, a, a code for some uh, nefarious activity. And out of that kind of riff, 
developed the idea that really it was about a child sex ring. And somebody just latched onto this notion of Comet Pizza, a pizzeria in uh, Washington, DC. One of the only reasons why it was able to be debunked very swiftly, because it's very hard to prove something, to prove a negative, as you know, to prove something like this isn't true, is that the claim was that it was out of the basement of this restaurant. Comet Pizza in Washington, DC, there is no basement. So that was uh, Im important. Nevertheless, it didn't stop a young man from, a young American uh, turning up at Comet Pizza armed with a semi-automatic weapon, determined to get to the bottom of this alleged child sex ring, uh, who was luckily arrested before he killed anyone. That will, we perhaps might come back to that when we talk about why all this matters. So that's a category of fake news, invented stories either for the motive of online profit or somehow for online propaganda, because the 4chan people, I should have said, were very anti-Hillary and, and pro-Donald Trump, partly because they thought it was almost just a good joke, the notion of electing Donald Trump as president. Uh, some of us might only partially agree with that sentence. Um, in the second uh, category then, if those are in that sort of slight gray area, uh, of, of, um, that I would distinguish um, would be you know, the overt sort of political move, in which it's not even ambiguous, it is, or a, a gray area, but clearly a political. I would say the claim that was on the side of the bus campaigning for leave in the referendum, 350 million, we send 350 million to the European Union, uh, a, a number that was just debunked everywhere, and including by the Institute of Fiscal Studies and actually government itself, uh, the Office of National Statistics, you know, on any reading, it just wasn't 350 million, even at its most, it's 200, it was 200, is 250 million because of the rebate, etc. You know the whole story. And the people behind Leave, Dominic Cummings, crucially brought before a parliament, parliamentary committee, was confronted with the evidence and then just persisted in it anyway. That was clearly something that wasn't true, provably untrue, advanced for political purposes. I would say the same. Uh, in the same category, same campaign, was the claim that Turkey was about to join the European Union and 76 million uh, people would be eligible to come here. And you'll remember the graphic way that was represented with sort of dark as if soiled footprints walking in to Britain. Both of those were to advance a political agenda, not, not complicated to work it out. Uh, from, a sim from a different source now, just, uh, but again, political rather than about getting clicks online or profit. Um, I would mention the statement by Sean Spicer, the beleaguered in somewhat almost hapless, um, much satirized press secretary for Donald Trump. Incidentally, the word is that he has resigned as press secretary, but nobody else will take the job, and therefore he has to continue doing it, which is a sort of, you know, an arcane form of punishment, I think, <laughs> for him. Um, but he, uh, you'll remember, on the day of, really, actually, or maybe the, it was the next day, of the, after the inauguration of Donald Trump, stood before the press court and said that the crowds for Donald Trump were bigger than the crowds for Barack Obama. And yet, you know, the pictures in front of you, any photograph analysis said the opposite, um, and anyone could see that. And he just said more people were there in person and uh, watching it on television, period. Uh, again, it was to advance a political purpose, which was, you know, my president's crowds are bigger than yours. And uh, uh, even in the face of evidence, again, not about profit, about political purpose. But then, uh, because I'm aware that these have all been, you know, attacking the Leave campaign and attacking Donald Trump on sort of one side of the political flow, I just want to mention another one, partly just to make the point that this isn't only from the right. But the uh, a fake news story exposed as such appeared on the Canary website, a hugely successful uh, website on the left of British politics, which um, uh, did a story uh, with uh, the night of the Manchester bombing, or in the, uh, small, in the hours after the Manchester bombing, which said, even after the Manchester bombing and all these people dead, this was the Sun's front page. And it showed you the Sun front page with the date of the day after the Manchester bombing, which just had an anti-Corbyn story, and the Canary is very pro-Corbyn, uh, an anti-Jeremy -Cor Corbyn front page. And of course, this was hugely shared in the hundreds of thousands as an example of the Sun's callousness and ideological uh, uh, obsession with taking down Jeremy Corbyn. It turned out that was the first edition of the Sun, which went to press at 10 p.m. before the bomb at the Manchester Arena had gone off. 
Um, and therefore, there was no way the Sun could have come up with a front page that reflected the Manchester bombing. And eventually, to their credit, the Canary did take it down, but only after hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people had shared it. But um, you know, we can debate whether the Canary would have known that. I think it would have been pretty obvious because the front page, that Sun front page, was tweeted at around 10.30 that evening, maybe earlier, when the bombing had happened about uh, six or seven minutes earlier. So um, fake news of this kind uh, you know, exists in many places, uh, both left and right. That's my point. Um, because I'm mentioning the Manchester bombing, I think it's worth talking about a, in a way, little known third category between profit and propaganda. And this one is mystifying to me and will require the skills of a psychologist, I think, rather than any other kind of analyst, which is a phenomenon which does happen after terror attacks where people. Uh, disseminate, on particular on social media, lies, uh, it seems, for the only sole purpose of being retweeted uh, heavily and or going viral on Facebook. And these are lies in which they show fake photographs of fake victims of terror attacks. And people will put up a picture, which later emerges to have been taken from a catalogue for children's clothing, for example, and say, we're still searching for our five-year-old child. Please, if you know where he is. Uh, and there are, this has been documented, a very good piece by BuzzFeed, who really went th through this. Terribly traumatic experiences for people. It was one woman in Australia, minding her own business, who suddenly got bombarded by calls saying, it seems as if your daughter is in this Manchester attack. They had taken a photograph from somewhere and just d did it. There's no profit to be gained from that that I can see. It doesn't advance any political agenda. It does seem as if the only motive is to somehow sort of ride the wave of a big global news story and somehow get the sort of sugar rush of being widely shared. So, you know, it's another form of fake news, but perhaps outside our remit um, this evening. Instead, let's uh, focus on the, that second category that I was just mentioning, which is um, those sort of political 350 million on the side of a bus, uh, you know, tech, uh, migrants coming in from Turkey when there was no realistic prospect of Turkey joining the European Union even within the next decade or two. Uh, those uh, claims made by political campaigners or politicians, uh, uh, that I think brings us to post-truth. As I say, these categories of fake news and post-truth, they, they overlap and sort of allied into each other. But I think um, this gets us closer to where we want to go with, with this point about post-truth and what is it? Uh, as you'll know, the Oxford English Dictionary made post-truth its word or phrase of the year for 2016, and really 2016 is when it flourished and blossomed both in fact and also as a point of discussion. For some, and in fact I wrote this when the phrase was first in circulation, it, it is just a sort of another word, a euphemism for lying, and we, you know, there is a sense in which we should almost just say, well, why don't, don't give it this fancy name of post-truth, 350 million is just a, on the side of the bus, it's just a lie. And in a way, it enables the politician to sort of get off the hook by saying post-truth. It sounds sort of interesting rather than just, um, you know, wrong. Um, there is, though, something different, just, and it's worth trying to work it out. Just as there have always been news stories that are wrong, factually wrong, and some people try and credit, uh, correct them, there's always been, in politics, spin and lies and propaganda and deceptions. And, you know, people can go very far back. I've been, you know, ahead of speaking tonight, I was trying to look. People always talk about the World, World War I and stories about the uh, Kaiser's army bayoneting babies as being a sort of definitive example of untruthful propaganda. It turns out that Pope, second mention of a Pope this evening, um, uh, Pope Urban II during the Crusades claimed that Muslims were the infidel, were circumcising Christian men. Uh, there was no evidence for that, but that was a claim even then. So, you know, a millennium ago, uh, and oddly, we're going to come back to a fake news story from a, nearly a thousand years ago later. Um, so this has been around for a long time. This is some, we want, we need in a way to reach for something different to uh, explain post-truth. It is something uh, more than just a lie or spin or propaganda deception. We've had those before. I think there are two uh, big differences that make separate post-truth from a conventional lie. The first is a difference on the part of the teller, uh, and the second is a difference on the part of the listener, both the person spreading the lie and the person receiving it. On the part of the teller, the difference, I think, between a liar and a peddler of post-truth is that the peddler of post-truth ha has no regard at all to 
whether or not what they're saying is truthful or a lie. Um, here, it's very useful to cite the book by the philosopher Harry Frankfurt on bullshit, which I'm sure some of you know, in which uh, Frankfurt said that bullshit was different from a lie because it was not, um, it was, in, in, in it's part of rhetoric, it was intended to persuade, but it had no regard for truth. The liar cares about the truth and attempts to hide it. The bullshitter doesn't care if what they say is true or false. Only, they only care whether or not their listener is persuaded. And I think it's a really useful distinction. And just to sort of make it human, I thought it would be useful to contrast two American presidents for this purpose. On the one hand, a notorious liar in office, Richard Nixon, um, who, you know, as I corrected, resigned in 1974, not 1973. Uh, driven from office over his lies. Now, the interesting thing about when you go, re, go over the facts again of Watergate, all of Nixon's public statements, and many of the public statements of the people he sent out to speak, have a kind of convoluted, tortured quality to them in which you can tell the person is trying to stay within the bounds of truth. So we're very familiar with that, with politicians, when you ask them a question and they come up with something which, technically speaking, is just about true because they are aware of where the kind of boundaries lie and they are trying to sort of navigate their way through them. Uh, and Nixon was like that all the time. And so it's, you get you know, the statements about there was no break-in at that time or I do not recognize that account or um, you know, I do not recall. These are people who are trying to avoid lying. Mistakes were made. I'm not going to say who made them. You know. These are all the techniques and verbal, you know, the, these locutions of people who were trying to avoid an overt untruth. And Nixon was a lawyer and had famously advised his team, and this has become part of the sort of canon of political wisdom, that it's never the crime that gets you, it's the cover-up. And he told his team, never lie. Now, you know, he was lying when he said that, in a way. But he was trying to avoid it because he knew that it was a cost. He did have regard to, tr to truth, even when he was violating it. The other American president, in my mind, is Donald Trump who is just different. And sending out his press secretary to say, pick crowd with few people in it is bigger than crowd with big, uh, lots of people in it, is somebody who doesn't have that basic regard for truth. And there are so many examples, and you'll know that um, many of the US media are keeping a daily tracker of Donald Trump's untruths. And I think it stands at the moment, and but it will have increased since I looked, um, at something like 780 proven falsehoods since he took the oath of office a matter of months ago. And, you know, now you'll know, just, you know, John Profumo, to go back a long time, resigned his whole career as a politician and spent, served sort of 30 years of penance in obscurity for one lie. And there is Donald Trump who is, can, you know, on a good day, rack up dozens. Uh, and there are people who monitor them. And they, there's one guy, Daniel Dale, very good correspondent, for a Canadian newspaper who, during the campaign, would tweet out at the end of each day of having listened to him, Trump's falsehoods for the day, he eventually found that Twitter was not a medium that could cope with the sheer, so you would have to link to a separate sort of blog page he set up just so you could list them all, even though it was on a daily, pay, uh, daily basis. Uh, so but, so uh, there are many, many falsehoods with, with Trump. But I just want to pick one because it's, it's so telling, really, which is an, it came in an interview with Trump's longtime butler at the Florida resort of Mar-a-Lago, where the butler who served Trump for decades um, was telling the reporter from the New York Times various stories as he gave her, I think, a tour of Mar-a-Lago. And they came to a room which is known as the nursery. And there are decorative, childlike uh, drawings on the, or patterns on the tiles of this nursery. And he told a story how Donald Trump used to tell him as butler to, when he was showing people around the building, to say that these tiles were hand-drawn by Walt Disney is an amazing thing, you know, lovely drawings for children. These are hand-drawn tiles by Walt Disney. And the butler, and I'm sure he learned not to do this after this episode, said, Mr. Trump, that's amazing, is that true? And Trump looked at him with a gleam in his eye and said, who cares? And who cares is such a powerful statement of where Trump stands on the truth. He doesn't care. He just says whatever is a good story, what will sound good or will sound persuasive to whoever he's trying to persuade that day. So. I think this is what post-truth is. It is when you don't care as to the truth or falsehood of a proposition. You've been told that 350 million isn't true by the people who know, and you still keep it on the side of your bus. 
you know, you've been told, you know that those tiles were not designed by Walt Disney, but you say it anyway because it sounds good. And a thousand other examples. So the, the post-truth is different from lies in that regard. And I would suggest more deeply, there is a sort of philosophical worldview underpinning that, not that the people who are practitioners of this could necessarily articulate it, but it dis I think what's going on in the, for the true, for the real post-truther is a, they are questioning whether or not truth is even possible, whether it can ever be grasped. And um, my colleague Matthew Dancone, who's written a tremendous book on post-truth, has uh, posits that, that what is going on with the people of post-truth is they are fundamentally arguing that reality and truth can never really be ascertained. And the set text for this, the remarks after that, Sean Spicer remark about inaugural crowds, the remarks of Kellyanne Conway, who you'll remember said, well, you know, it's the, the interviewer, Chuck Todd of NBC, said, we know the facts of who was there. There are these pictures. And she said, yes. And Sean gave alternative facts for that. <laughs> And it was as if to say, look, you've got your facts and I've got my facts. There is no fact. There's just interpretation and opinion and a, a, a sort of cacophony of all of our views. Uh, and we will never get to a, a hard, knowable truth. And that's a big epistemological statement uh, they're making, even if, as I say, they wouldn't necessarily put it that way. Um, but as I said, it's both about the teller and the listener. So, uh, you know, there's the... Trump figure who says, who cares? But there's also on the part of the audience a kind of reciprocal response, which is, we don't care. And the actions of, and one has to be careful here, because of course the people who voted Leave, for example, had an enormous number of motives, including wholly legitimate motives for voting. But the act of the country collectively voting Leave was to, in its effect, even if that wasn't the conscious purpose, to reward lies. Because it said to people, you can put 350 million on the side of a bus even when you know it's provably untrue, and guess what? You can win. And Donald Trump's lies can be catalogued daily, and he can still, in his case, not win, but still become president. And so the electorate, the voters, the people, us, are sending a message which is, look, truthfulness is only one of a variety of qualities we may seek in those uh, who would lead us. It, it, might, you know, some, it may be third most important or fifth most important, or for some voters, first most important, but it's only one among many. Whereas I think before, um, it did have a different kind of status. Hence my Profumo example, or even the Nixon example. That if you were found out as a liar, and remember we still don't know to this day whether Nixon had any involvement in the actual crime, the break-in in, at the Watergate building at Democratic headquarters, that was almost secondary. The important point was the lying. Uh, and, you know, in his case, everything that came with it, obstruction of justice, etc. But the vote in the post-truth era, we're sending a different message, which is we don't care. And we are sort of partners with Donald Trump in this. He doesn't care and his audience don't care. So that was my um, attempt to get to grips with what these terms mean, fake news and post-truth. Um, why has this happened? There are you know, in the manner of Agatha Christie's murder on the Orient Express, there are a large number of suspects in this inquiry. Uh, and I think, spoiler alert, uh, they all played some kind of role. Um, the first one, I think, is that truth um, is hard to separate from trust. And uh, there has been, on both sides of the Atlantic, actually, and beyond, a collapse of public trust um, that that it goes wider than just in those people we uh, expect to uphold truth, but absolutely includes them. And, you know, with an eye on the clock, I will go through them quite quickly, but it is, you know, it's in our minds today because of this interview perhaps John Chilcott gave about the Iraq war, but it is clear for a whole generation of people, and actually more, um, that the Iraq War of 2003, both in Britain and America, broke public trust in politicians. Both George W. Bush and Tony Blair said there were WMD, there weren't WMD, and that broke tr trust in political leaders. More we could say, but let's just let that stand there. Nearly 10 years ago, the financial crash. Uh, clearly, that left distrust in those people who would be the custodians of our money, the banks, uh, and the entire edifice of finance around it. It broke that trust. In Britain, a year later, 2009, the expenses affair, you know, for, uh, on, the, on the scale of sort of world corruption scandals, 
the duck house and the moat cleaning probably don't really rank, but it meant that it cemented this belief that politicians are in it for themselves and cannot fundamentally be trusted. Indeed, in 2014, according to a survey, only 18%, less than a fifth, uh, said they trusted politicians to put the country first uh, rather than themselves. Uh, so that's those in terms of sort of public bodies, government, finance, uh, uh, members of parliament. Uh, but the trust uh, pro corrosion extended wider. This stain spread, if you like. And I think it's the Jimmy Savile scandal, which became a scandal for the BBC and in some ways the media. Uh, it was was big. I think the BBC has survived it, but it went to trust. And uh, the you know other part of the media forest, the hacking scandal involving uh, News International, as then was, also uh, further reduced trial, trust. If you put those things together, it suggests that the referees on the pitch, if you like, those people who previously uh, performed a role in maintaining. Or, or drawing the boundaries broadly of what was truthful and what wasn't, those referees have been discredited. And that was important because before, when there were competing claims, you'd be able to turn to somebody to play the role of arbiter. And I think the BBC, for example, has always played that role. But even actually um, in terms of government, you know, if, a, if there was an argument about I don't know, climate change, for example, and then a government report comes out of saying this is, you know, the British Antarctic Survey. These are our, this is how we measure ice uh, in the Antarctic. That would be uh, seen as a reliable, trustworthy figure. So, if there's an erosion of trust, so as I say, different circumstances, Iraq and expenses, but overall, it's meant the referees who previously had uh, maintained uh, a kind of boundaries of what was held to be truthful and untruthful. <laughs> They have been discredited. A second culprit, those people who've gone about this deliberately, and I think that's important because it's often we can think of this as almost as if it is akin to a change in the weather, rather than there being actual culprits, and I want to talk about them briefly. Um, th there are people who have set about to corrode truth and fact, and that's hard to you know, take in, and yet it's, 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 it's correct, and it goes back a long time. The precedent, I think, is the tobacco companies. Just as uh, techno science was pointing to a link to lung cancer, the documents have come out since. Uh, the, the, the leading tobacco companies actively and consciously thought, how do we deal with this challenge? And they hit on a method, which has more or less been the template ever since, which was not to try and rebut it, because that was going to be very difficult, to try and say, this is untrue. Instead, to do something different, which was to create a climate of doubt, conf maybe even confusion, but just to say there is a conflicting view. And so various bodies were set up in the United States uh, that appeared to be semi-scientific, you know, with names like Research Council and that kind of thing, uh, well funded by the tobacco industry, who would just have people who appeared medical or scientific to say, well, there's also a counter study. It's not just this way. And so the rest of the media, often particularly those bits of the media that believe in balance, would feel obliged to have somebody come on and say there's a link to lung cancer, and then somebody else who says a different view and to present the two. And that way, that was overtly, in their own correspondence, the tobacco industry, that was their goal. Just as long as there's parity and debate and confusion, we can keep going. And you know, it took a very long time to shift that. That was then, that exact same model was replicated in the case of climate change, well-funded bodies uh, who masquerade often as scientific, uh, who exist just to say there's a question about human-made uh, global warming and climate change, and have succeeded tremendously well in this kind of parity. So 95% of the world's climate scientists say climate change is real. And nevertheless, when, you know, if I, I hadn't got to hand the exact statistics, but a number more than 5% of media debates and discussions about this subject will include some notion of parity, uh, rather than it should be, if it was matching the, the 95 to 5%, it would only be, you know, 5% of the time would you hear somebody from that side of the argument. Instead, it is quite often that, you know, Lord Lawson or whatever will pop up as somebody who's a climate change uh, skeptic. It has achieved that goal, and it was deliberate. Tobacco companies in the 50s and 60s, fossil fuel companies in our own time. Uh, and I, you know, want to make sure we give an honorable mention, since he is meeting the American president in the next uh, coming hours, to Vladimir Putin and, um, and, the, and Russia, because they too are, and he too, is engaged in um, 
deliberate uh, confusion, falsehood, etc. And my colleague Sean Walker, the Guardian's Moscow correspondent, wrote a tremendously revealing piece about uh, visiting and seeing from the inside a Moscow troll factory where people are paid uh, to go online and comment and spread doubt and denial and falsehood and just muddy the waters. And they did it very specifically in the case of the jet that was shot down over Ukraine and coming up with all kinds of, you know, apparent links and data and everything else. But just to throw up a storm of dust that makes it hard to see through. And um, that is deliberate, which is um, why I think it's worth singling out. Um, in the same vein, actually, I would um, mention the uh, people, again, in this category of people who are uh, deliberate about this, uh, conspiracy theorists. They don't have to be you know, well-funded by fossil fuel industry or Moscow, but for their own, usually propagandistic reasons, deliberately setting out to spread uh, confusion and falsehood. Uh, but to our textbook case would be Bertha-ism, the claim that Barack Obama, not coincidentally America's first black president, could not possibly have been born in the United States. He must be foreign. Uh, essentially a racist conspiracy theory uh, and spearheaded, of course, by Donald Trump, who was the first person to really take it mainstream. But conspiracy theories are everywhere, as you know, about 9-11 and about everything. Uh, and again, it is deliberate. It is a deliberate attempt to um, put out a version which, you know, the people behind it may believe is true, but I think, again, with Trump and, and, and the Bertha thing, the, you know, the, the full birth certificate was released and yet it carried on. So I think you have to say that's people deliberately spreading um, falsehood. Uh, the other category, though, of people who would do deliberately take, uh, you know, wage war on truth, slightly more controversially, I would add those people who deliberately go after uh, people who are doing their best, yes, with mistakes, but to purvey news that is more or less truthful. And the war on the so-called mainstream media, the MSM, a phrase incidentally that only used to exist on the right, it was Sarah Palin and that kind of world that used to talk about the MSM, but has now got a, a whole traction on the left as well. Um, that notion of saying that people who journalists who are in the business with flaws, with limitations, of course, but trying to get uh, to establish the truth that they are purveyors of fake news. So once again, Donald Trump's war against CNN and New York Times and Washington Post, uh, organizations in the case of the Washington Post, I worked there for a while and New York Times I've written for, these are places that have exacting, some may even say uh, pedantic uh, standards of rigor in their determination to be absolutely accurate. And nevertheless, he with one uh, brush of the hand calls them fake news. And in our own country, and it's going to be very strictly topical, we have Andrea Leadsom saying the broadcaster should be more patriotic. And just today, uh, Liam Fox uh, attacking the BBC, saying that they would rather see um, Britain fail than Brexit succeed. Um, you know, even though the BBC, to my mind, is uh, always a seeker of, even when it falls short, of, the, of high standards. And again, just so you don't think I'm only after going after the right and mentioning Donald Trump and Liam Fox, uh, just today, again, to keep it very topical, uh, Robbie Gibb, the head of uh, the editor of the Daily Politics and other programs on BBC, has been appointed by Theresa May as her new head of communications, which immediately prompted uh, a, to uh, a torrent of criticism from the left, saying, well, this goes to show that the BBC and the NSM are, uh, have a you know, pro-Tory bias because Robbie Gibbs is going off to work for Theresa May. So this, this thing of tearing down the institutions that, with their flaws, do aim to be truthful, that again, I would say, is part of the deliberate mix. Um, let me rattle through um, the rest of these causes, these culprits that Agatha Christie style I'm tempted to point the finger at. Um, Beyond the, those were sort of people who you could identify. I would suggest there are some processes that are also at work and that are so important in our time. The first one is that a trend that has been noticeable long before just 2016, the year of post-truth, and that is the notion that narrative, ho ho, trumps facts. Um, that uh, the visceral uh, outmatches or outstrips the cerebral, the, the emotional is stronger than the rational 
where we make particularly political judgments. This has been clear or reported on for some time, a book called The Political Brain by Drew Weston got a lot of attention uh, after the 2004 election in, uh, in the United States where he analyzed really closely how audiences reacted to John Kerry, the Democrat candidate who would reveal, who would you know, catalog compelling facts and data, and George W. Bush who wouldn't, uh, and instead would sort of tell a more folksy story. And he would, you know, there were experiments monitoring brain activity, and it became just clear. And Jonathan Haidt in that book, The Righteous Mind, has followed this up more. Just the way we work when we make decisions is not the way we might like to think we work. We would like to tell ourselves that we assess the evidence coolly and rationally and then decide that having weighed up all the programs, it is the program of this political party that matches our policy choices. That is not how our brains work. What actually happens is we have a feeling about this political tribe or that political tribe or that candidate or this candidate. And then once we have that feeling, we will then make the evidence conform to that preference. It takes a huge amount to shift us from those allegiances. Uh, 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 and, and usually what does it is not more data. It isn't more sort of rational judgments. This was true, I think, in 2004. It is becoming more so, not less. What it leads to is a sense that when something feel, if something feels true, remember this sort of emotional side of the brain rather than the calculating side of the brain, if something feels true, that is what matters. Uh, a useful text here is the US comedian Stephen Colbert, who coined the word truthiness, uh, which is a tremendous word. It wasn't whether it was um, actually true. Does it feel true? And he was satirizing it, uh, that notion of truthiness, and yet it now feels like a prescient description of our time. Uh, and again, um, just to keep it bang up to date, I was very struck that John Chilcott in his interview said that he believed Tony Blair was emotionally truthful which is, I think, a fascinating phrase and goes to this thing that Tony Blair said a few times in the argument about Iraq. He would say, I only know what I believe. Uh, now, I think he meant just uh, almost as a rhetorical device. I, I, I'm only talking about what I believe in this particular moment. But as a phrase, it's such an interesting one, as if the only thing you can know for certain as true is what you have a conviction about. So rather than just, I only know what the evidence points to, I only know what I believe, and, jo uh, uh, and John Chilcott saying emotionally truthful. Uh, which I thought was very uh, interesting. Uh, Matthew Dancona, who I mentioned before in his book on post-truth, points a finger, an accusing finger, at Freudianism. Uh, he believes that it made us, uh, and, the, and the sort of decade, century of therapy that has followed, has made us prize emotional sincerity. In other words, it doesn't matter what the actual facts were. The important thing is that this person feels it, and therefore we should help them in that way. Uh, that you know, the person's personal narrative, what happened to them, that's you know what, what matters most, um, rather than any sort of cold fact. He also, while he's at it, points a, another accusing finger, and I hesitate saying this here in the academy, but at postmodernism, uh, and he says that uh, postmodern studies while having done a good job of making sure you know, more voices were heard than the previous sort of dominant narrative that was allowed in public discourse, that was a good thing. But the problematic precedent it set was in establishing the idea that there are just shifting narratives and interpretations rather than a single objective truth. So single objective truth became, well, that was a sort of dead white male idea. And in fact, there was no history. There were just histories and herstories, etc. The problem, says Dan Kona, is that that has led us into a kind of relativism where, you know, we suddenly, the, uh, that road, though it starts in, you know, the French Academy, it ends in Kellyanne Conway saying there are alternative facts. My facts and your facts, they're all equal. Uh, and he suggests that's a problem. Uh, another culprit and relevant to our own time is uh, obviously, you know, it's so easy to say the internet. I don't just mean that. I mean very specifically social media. We sort of nudged it, inflicted it when I was talking about uh, the way those fake stories went viral. Um, Social media has a very particular character in what, it, in what works and what doesn't. And I see this even just in you know, traffic patterns for the way Guardian articles are shared. You can really see what, what works and what doesn't. It, the organizing principle, it seems, is not of what is shared online is not veracity, but solidarity. So people will share something that they agree with that's, that even expresses something about their identity rather than because this, is the, because this is the most factually accurate piece or this includes really interesting data, it's more this is who we are. Those are the things that get shared. 
you add to that a kind of confirmation bias that happens online where the things you see are the things that you are likely to agree with. Uh, that has a, a completely um, exponential or self-reinforcing effect where we own it, we see more and more and more of what we expect to see and that leads us as observers to not just weigh up very coolly but rather to sort of run with the herd of people who are like us. And that incidentally in social media is not a bug, it is a feature. It is the way the algorithms are designed. They are designed uh, so that you will see what you are likely to agree with. Um, that is how the, the more or less the advertising model on Facebook and others work. Um, it is a profitable model for them uh, and that is central to how these things get spread. We, you know, we, we may talk about this more when we take questions, but the notion of the filter bubble isn't just something that people are choosing in a kind of, uh, as a sort of act of social weakness that we should just uh, correct in ourselves. The technology is shoving us into those filter bubbles. They're sort of funneling towards like, uh, us towards like-minded others. Uh, just a fleeting point as well about the uh, uh, social media and, inter and the internet in general. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a sort of cosmetic point and yet I think significant, which is that online lies look like truth. Uh, and they, there is no immediate visual or aesthetic difference. In the past, if you were to pick up in the 1970s a newsletter of the far right, uh, it would look like a shoddy publication that had been run off on a sort of amateur stencil machine. Nobody under 50 knows what they are. Um, but they, it would look like a piece of rubbish. And an article in The Times would look like an article in The Times. Now, on social media, so that story about the Pope um, uh, endorsing Trump, to the naked eye, it absolutely looked like an, a real newspaper, a real story from a mainstream news organization. Uh, and one of the stories that went viral uh, in the last year uh, was circulating in a thing called the Denver News. Many, many people posted, posted it, shared it because they thought it was in the Denver Post, which is a century old established newspaper of Colorado. Instead, it was in a new thing that was invented out of someone's basement called the Denver News. There, there's j just visually, you don't have the usual signpost. So they, we, in terms of media literacy, it is very, very challenging. Um, the last thing I would just say about the changing media landscape, slightly uh, trivial point, is about the rise of reality TV, a form where we know it's staged, we know it's fake, but we lap it up anyway. Um, wasn't expecting to mention Love Island in the annual School of Education, Communication and Society lecture, but here we go. Uh, you know, it, it's there, as, as it is a particular new form, it's a new genre where everyone's in on the joke. It goes to the Walt Disney tiles thing of who cares, you enjoy it anyway. And it seems to me so fitting that that clip that Donald Trump made go viral this week, this sort of um, uh, modified clip that appeared to show him wrestling a man with a CNN logo for a head, how absolutely fitting that the activity involved was wrestling and Trump has a corporate connection with the wrestling federation wrestling which is the ultimate fake uh, spectacle because everyone's in on the joke you know it's fake and yet it has an audience anyway I mean wrestling is truly the sort of uh, Trump activity and so it was so sort of revealing that that was the one he would pick all right, I know that um, we must make time for the conversation to widen. So I, the two last areas I want to get into is why this matters and what we can do about it. Uh, and so I will go through those quickly. I said that this early on, pretty early on, that I might go, I'd gone back once a thousand years mentioning the Crusades, and I was going to do it again. And that is because I want to just mention fleetingly, I made a, uh, Sharon mentioned this program I do on the radio called The Long View, where we look for a historical precedent uh, for something going on now. And we did recently a program about fake news. And we were expecting to find a precedent from perhaps the Victorian era. In the end, we went with a precedent about the murder of a 12-year-old boy in Norwich in March of 1144, a boy who came, became known as William of Norwich, who was found, his body was found uh, in the woods, uh, not far from the cathedral, uh, very badly mutilated. Uh, his story was then taken up by Thomas of Monmouth, a monk who was uh, a chronicler uh, and he said that William of Norwich had been murdered by the town's Jews, the Jewish population of Norwich, which then is thought to have numbered probably in the low 20s, meaning about 24 or 25 people. Uh, he said the town's Jews had killed him, uh, uh, and he suggested that might have been for religious purposes. Now, that then became, uh, when 
viral in the village and, ar and around East Anglia of the time, in the town rather, uh, and the, because it meant that William had sort of somehow given his life, uh, been murdered by people who didn't believe in Jesus and therefore he'd given his life to Jesus and people began to say there were miracles when they went to the site of William's uh, death. Um, scholars have been, you know, scholars have been active on this story for some time, and uh, you know, have made as, as conclusive as you possibly can, including even at the time, that this story by Thomas of Monmouth was invented out of whole cloth. Uh, it elevated his role as a local figure, but it also meant that Norwich and the cathedral suddenly became a site of pilgrimage, which was big business in those days because it meant you were on the pilgrimage trail, and pilgrims came and they came attesting to miracles at the site of William's grave. There was no evidence for it at all. Uh, the likelihood is, as you would expect with a child murder, that he was murdered by a member of his own family, you know, of course. Um, nevertheless, the story mattered because about a century later, there was another clay case about Hugh of Lincoln. Uh, and this time the story was elaborated that the Jews of Lincoln had murdered him and done so because in order to use his blood for ritual purposes, for religious purposes and to uh, the baking of uh, Passover food. The point, uh, uh, the reason why I mention this is, this is the, the case in Norwich and then in Lincoln were the earliest reported cases anywhere of the so-called blood libel, the claim that Jews use the blood of non-Jewish or Christian children for religious purposes. The blood libel lived on for a thousand years and went round the world. It was, as it happens, England's unique contribution to anti-Semitism. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, peculiarly came out of England, but went everywhere, including, you know, in, a, in, in lurid fashion, Tsarist Russia, but also Nazi Germany, all of whom used this image, uh, this um, motif, and it continues to surface in parts of the world now, in, including in the Middle East. Um, it had consequences, enormous consequences. The Jews of Lincoln were massacred uh, in the late part of the 12th century uh, until they were, and the Jews of England were eventually expelled. Uh, and pogroms all over the world have been committed in the name of what began as a fake news story. So fake news matters. And it is very tempting to shrug it off as, and I've been doing that with a lot of these stories, that they are somehow funny and obviously on their face ridiculous. But they do have legs and they have a lifespan, and in that case, one that lasted a millennium. That's in some ways the most extreme, but there are other life and death examples. Uh, the claim by Andrew Wakefield uh, that MMR, the MMR jab for, against measles, mumps, and rubella, that there was some link to autism, wholly debunked in study after study. It led to people uh, not taking MMR or the, taking up the injections for their children and for the herd immunity, the collective immunity, to decline, including in this city of London, to the point where there were a, a reoccurrence recurrence of diseases that people had thought had been uh, kept at bay, including measles. So that's a, just a straightforward case of how that can have real world consequences. But really beyond that, we need truth in order, you know, you don't need to say this to a room full of scholars, but in scientific inquiry rests on there being achievable, knowable facts. You cannot have contract law unless both sides in a court of law can agree on what the facts were. You cannot possibly hope for justice if eventually you do not believe it is possible to know the truth of an event. Uh, we need to know the facts if we are able to make any kind of collective decisions as a society. You, I would argue, but you know, it's a partisan point, but we, you know, you, we were making a huge decision about Britain's future relationship in the European Union on the basis partly of things that were not true, including that 350 million claim. It is very difficult to make decisions as a society if you don't know the facts. I think it is significant that one of the early decisions made by the Trump administration, barely reported, was to radically, massively, I think by three quarters, cut the budget of the office of the census in the United States because you need facts to make decisions that are real and if, the, if, if you have a narrative that says the country is being overrun by illegal immigrants, you do not want facts to tell you otherwise and therefore cutting the budget of the census. It was not a coincidence, in other words, that we, Thomas Jefferson, a uh, founding father of the United States, said in 1787 in a letter from Paris, a government without, new, if he was offered the choice between a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. He would rather live in a country which had newspapers and no government than one that had government and no newspapers. He, that was because he knew and understood that government needed to be checked by a knowledgeable citizenry, and they cannot be if the news is fake and cannot be trusted. 
to finally then, and perhaps we'll expand on this when we talk, to come to what we might do about it. Uh, we're here in a place that thinks hard about education and, and the role of the media. I am, and perhaps it's been um, clear from what I've said, a believer in and really a defender in what has become an unfashionable cause because people prefer to bash than speak up for the MSM. But as somebody who works for The Guardian, what would you expect? But I would also feel that in, uh, in the last year, the mainstream media, and let's be, have some distance on it, take the case of the United States, has made it the case for its necessity, not just its worth, but its necessity. We know what we know about the Trump presidency in large part through the reporting of the Washington Post and the New York Times, who are diligent and forensic in their examination of this administration. Uh, Donald Trump would be allowed to have got away with a whole lot more if they were not there. That wasn't coming from people sharing posts, and it wasn't just coming from people's Twitter feeds. That was coming from old school shoe leather journalism, checking and checking again. And yes, the mainstream media did it. And other people, more polemical uh, you know, websites and others, are parasitical upon the work of those two organizations. And uh, the American public seems to have recognized that because subscriptions for both have gone through the roof. And, and while I'm here, I should mention contributions and subscriptions to The Guardian have done the same in the United States, which is interesting. So uh, that is one solution, uh, which is, and you can actually subscribe to any of those, and I think that is an act of the active citizen to do so, to support their work. The second thing has to be, uh, and I talked about technology, pressure by us as users of the big tech companies who are um, playing such a huge role in this situation. If you type in uh, the Holocaust into Google, it will take you very rapidly to sites of Holocaust denial uh, rather than a factual record of the Holocaust. Uh, that needs to be challenged and Google needs to be taken to task for that. They have been a bit, but more needs to happen. Uh, Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, uh, proposes that Facebook should tweak the algorithm so that if you are about to post something which has been widely debunked elsewhere, a button or a little alert will pop up on your screen saying, as he put it, you're about to make yourself look a fool in front of your friends. Do you really want to share this? Now, some people think, yeah, because of the Walt Disney tiles point, who cares? But a lot of people won't. Uh, and that seems to me the least uh, that could be done. Um, I've talked about, you know, that's them in a way, the, uh, the big media operators and what they do. There's a burden on us. I mentioned what we should do as readers and I think we should, you know, become subscribers when, and, uh, if we believe in that. But I think also, like, just as Post Truth exists partly because of what the, the teller is saying but also in what the listener is doing, we have work to do, work of due diligence that we are going to have to do as consumers. Um, and that is something that is obviously needs to be taught. Uh, it would, I suggest, be taught to children from the youngest possible age how they can learn to discern uh, what is true from what is false, how, what sort of kite marks of quality they can look for, who that they can rely on as trusted sources. This, I'm afraid, is hard work. It will, it does require effort on the part of the reader and user. Uh, and that is difficult um, to take on because it, you know, we, are, we expect everything to be swift and instant. And yes, this is a two-way street. Journalists like me need to regain trust. Uh, and and you know, I know a lot of us have lost it. Uh, and you know, I can talk about you know, my own ro role in that. But we have, so we have to do our bit to regain trust. But citizens also have to, in some ways, relearn the ability to trust when those sources deserve to be trust, trusted. And that means becoming discerning. Um, I would also say when we combat, we go into the bear pit of argument and we take on uh, the, the peddlers of post-truth, we have to be able to argue in the same coin as them. And what I mean by that is not with lies, but if they have understood that emotion and, and the viscera speak as loudly as reason and the cerebral cortex, we have to argue in those terms too. And that means we can't let the devil have all the good tunes. We have to be able to talk in terms of narrative and story as well, even actually about truth itself. Rather than it seeming like the province of dry facts and data, it has to seem like something which has an emotional resonance and that matters. And perhaps those examples I gave about MMR or the blood libel point us some way towards that. I would say two last things. Um, 
One is about laughter, um, that satire is a useful weapon, but I have ambivalence about it. Uh, the, the, the late night talk show host in America, John Oliver and others have done Samantha B. They've done very, very good work in holding Trump to account. Uh, and they do, you know, they do important work. I worry because of what I said before about the temptation to then think it's all a joke. And so I, I honestly put my hands up and say I'm conflicted on satire. But I want to mention one sat satirist and an idea he has. Uh, Armando Iannucci uh, suggests that just as there is Tinder and Grindr, we should have a, an app that, where you can swipe left or right and find someone you politically disagree with that you then engage with to force you out of your filter bubble. He suggests, uh, so that with a pleasing sort of euphony with uh, Tinder and Grindr, that it should be called Ponder, which I thought is <laughs> rather nice. Uh, but the last thing I wanted to say uh, is just about a particular sort of personal experience I had. Uh, in, in the year 2000, I covered for The Guardian the trial of David Irving. Uh, the, not the trial of David Irving, I must not say that. The trial brought by David Irving. Uh, a libel case he brought against Deborah Lipstadt, the historian, subject of this film, Denial, which many of you will have seen. Uh, Deborah Lipstadt, an American academic, had called David Irving a Holocaust denier, and he sued her for libel. He brought the case, I must stress that. Anyway, I sat in the, in the trial many days, and there was one day in particular where the testimony that was brought forward uh, relied on a whole lot of documentary evidence uh, of the uh, gas chambers and of uh, the death camps. And the first raft of evidence was interviews that SS officers themselves had given. And Irving listened to them, and then with a, he was defending himself, acting for himself. And with a sweep of the hand, he said, well, you can't trust any of that. People give, say all kinds of things uh, under duress. He was obviously trying to please his interrogators. All of it can be discredited. Well, then it was advanced the testimony from survivors. Well, obviously, they would make it all up because they wanted sympathy, and you can't believe a word they said. And then this, the day wore on like this, where more documents were presented. He said, no, that's a forgery, and no, that's made up. And I want to describe to you really not the thought that was going through my head, but the sensation I had, which was a physical sensation. I had a physically queasy sensation, as if the ground I was standing on was unsteady and rocking. It was as if I was at sea. Because I thought, as he was speaking, I was thinking, if David Irving decided to deny that Henry VIII had six wives, Whatever document you brought to him, he would have a reason why it was a fake. He would be able to dismiss any evidence. Because once you have decided that you can do that, that truth is not truth and that facts are not facts, you can deny anything. And then we can know nothing. And that was a physically queasy feeling I had uh, in that courtroom in the year 2000. And I had no idea then that what was a problem we thought identified with this figure of the far right and uh, de determined by the judge in his final ruling to be a pro-Nazi polemicist who was not a historian at all, but someone who faked, the historic, faked and doctored the historical record. Um, the, the problem that we thought was confined to him has actually become spread like a virus and is in our world. And I left that courtroom that day, and especially once the verdict was found, feeling that we had had a victory, but I now realize it was just a warning, really, of what the world we are now in. And I believe there is a fight to uh, be fought, uh, but also a fight that absolutely must be won. Thank you very much. That was a fascinating speech, and I know that many of you are very keen to ask questions and to start the discussion. So I will try to keep my uh, response uh, as short as I can possibly uh, make it, and um, uh, try to uh, perhaps uh, go a little bit deeper and perhaps uh, uh, explore some of the, the, the nuances of the main questions um, that, 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 uh, that Jonathan has explored here, namely what is new. Um, what is the nature of the problem, and perhaps also some su suggestions of what um, can be done about uh, the spread of, of, of fake news? I think the first, I think the, the analysis of what is new um, is in many ways uh, compelling, 
But perhaps there are some deeper um, uh, changes that have happened over time. I think uh, quite rightly um, he mentioned uh, the um, uh, way in which social media, in a sense, hypercharge our psychology, our, our demand to get things, uh, news that we agree with, things that we're comfortable with, and exclude those that we are not comfortable with. But I would argue that those changes have already happened earlier with the proliferation of media channels over time. So more and more uh, broadcasting channels, more and more newspapers, and that has enabled um, uh, citizens to more and more um, move away from these kind of um, overarching um, um, authoritative media towards media that kind of feed their particular worldviews, their polit particular political views, um, and, and therefore, um, in a way, fragment the public sphere and the space that we are all inhabiting as a kind of space where we f force some sort of a consensus about what is right, what is desirable, and, and what to do. Furthermore, I think there is a, 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 a long-term change and trend towards declining trust in authority. And I think that is uh, preceding the changes that we've seen here uh, in, in, in kind of growth of social media. It is related, I think, to uh, growing empowerment, to education, and that is, in a sense, a positive phenomenon, that there's more questioning of those sources of authority that provide um, truth and kind of more challenge. And the media landscape, the changes in the media landscape, enable us to see how perhaps the same amount, the same kinds of facts are constructed in very different ways, and how the selection of particular stories, the selection of particular facts, can lead to very different narratives. And if you consume different types of media, you can see how the same sort of facts can be constructed in very different narratives and different, in a sense, accounts of um, the truth, which are not necessarily misleading, but reflect particular worldviews and, and, and choices. I think it's very important um, to uh, uh, link the, 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 the issue of trust and the growing mistrust that I think was rightly um, identified, not just to individual events and perhaps decisions of governments, but to this kind of more uh, long-term uh, 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 decline in uh, trust in government uh, and, and understand what is driving that growing distrust. And I think I'd like to give you here some, uh, uh, some uh, facts, <laughs> at least as far as you can see from uh, uh, public opinion. There's an Edelman Trust Barometer, which is done uh, annually. It's a representative survey since 2001. So the good thing is it's done in the same way over time, so you can see uh, changes. And what is very interesting is uh, the decline in trust in uh, the media uh, and media as an institution over time and most particularly over uh, the last year, which is quite marked. So um, what we're seeing there um, is a, a, a decline in trust in the media, but also a decline in trust in government and business. And what is, what is interesting here is, is perhaps not that there's a decline of trust in these institutions of government, news media, uh, and to some extent also NGOs, but there's also a growing uh, gap in the trust between what is described as the general public and the informed public. So it's not just about the institutions, it's also a, 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 a divergence between the informed public, those who have uh, perhaps a higher degree, those who uh, uh, read, uh, inf inform themselves in a particular way, and those who, have, um, uh, who are not kind of counted in this kind of uh, information elite. So trust, uh, so, so that kind of gap is, um, is, is, I think, very important for understanding the nature of the problem because it, um, it points to the fact that, that there is a big polarization in what people believe and whom they listen to. And I think unless one understands that polarization within society, um, I think you can't quite understand why certain fake news, why certain claims resonate with parts of the population very powerfully, whereas with other populations, they are, they, with other parts, the informed public, they are outraged, and they think this is, this is horrible. And the problem is that quite often that those who are outraged with certain claims are perceived by the other part as kind of um, jeering them and uh, calling them stupid and, 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 in a sense, disrespecting their sense of identity. And that, I think that is quite important uh, for um, thinking about the solutions to the problem, that this is not just about 
politicians and, and expenses and Iraq war. It is about a change within society and within patterns of society where uh, there is a growing distrust of um, the, the kind of the broader public and um, the informed public. And I think politically what is interesting is the link to economic benefit and the kind of question of who benefits from the political changes over time and whether there is a kind of sense that there is a truth or a kind of a set of facts that serves one part of the population and another set that serves another. Now, that is, of course, that narrative needs to be challenged because um, truth is still truth, and some facts are clearly wrong and, and misleading. But I think that's the kind of the background to understanding why some of these developments, powered by technology, also uh, uh, resonate in uh, the kind of the broader public realm. I think what is also important to understand is that um, this kind of uh, crisis in uh, kind of trust, trust and, and post-truth is um, related to the crisis of journalism. And here um, we, we've heard about New York Times, Washington Post, and Guardian, but you know these papers are exceptions. The reality today is that most people who study communication media go into public relations. They, they work for NGOs because the working conditions are so much better. Local papers closed down, emerged. And journalists today work in an environment where they have much less time to check stories. They are much more reliant on kind of taking stuff from, from Twitter, from social media. And I think there is um, a, a widespread negligence in terms of kind of counterfactuals, uh, uh, checking of facts. And I think that helps to spread those news, even though professional standards at the top end are, are, are as high as they used to. Um, so I think that is an important, I think, area for self-criticism and kind of uh, introspection on the part of, of uh, I think, of journalists. I think the uh, one perhaps uh, important and perhaps positive or optimistic point to make is that this is not the same across the globe. There are countries where the media are trusted much more um, than in the UK. So, uh, for instance, Eurobarometer barometer shows that. 73% uh, of uh, people in the UK in 2015 do not tend to trust the printed press. This is the highest figure amongst all EU member states and about 23% higher than the EU average. In contrast, the figures of trust or distrust in UK, UK television are in line with the EU average, around 46%. So why is it that in some countries the media are actually still enjoying a considerable degree of trust, whereas perhaps in the UK they don't? And here, I think there is an issue around the question of partisanship of newspapers, the question to, which, to the extent to which, in particular, the press is seen as campaigning, is kind of aligned to one or two political parties, and to what extent um, the way in which these papers finance themselves may be part of the problem. So when it comes to solutions, I think we have to look at different areas of solutions. I think one area of addressing the problem, and I agree there is a problem, is to look at the funding of journalism, of quality journalism. And I think there is a question of whether the public, the taxpayer, should not play somewhat of a stronger role beyond broadcasting to help fund um, uh, journalism, to fund local journalism, to fund uh, newspapers in a way that doesn't, that, that is kind of arm's length and that preserves the independence of the press. And there are some countries in which that works. Uh, second point, I would um, suggest that um, Education is important, and I think education about what uh, social media can do and, and, and to what extent you can prove or disprove um, particular effects in social media. But also, I think, education about how our psychology works. And again, confirmation bias is a very powerful psychological element that helps to explain why we tend to seek out um, information that we agree with. And again, there's, a, a, I think, a very interesting um, uh, statistic um, that says 52% uh, of people rarely or never change position on important issues. Uh, we are 4%, four times more likely to ignore information that contradicts our views um, than, than those um, uh, that, 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 that confirms it. And 53% um, of the population do not regularly listen to institutions or people they disagree with. I think, that's, um, I think that is quite important, f not just for the general population, for everyone who's consuming news, but also for us as scientists. And the question whether we are always uh, sufficiently pluralistic in our approach, whether we are always looking at uh, perhaps the, the contradiction in, uh, in our research as we should. 
And again, when it comes to self-criticism, I think, when, and particularly in the UK, there is a question about um, perhaps going out a little bit more into the real world and going to the places where we normally wouldn't go to and talking to the people we normally wouldn't talk to and find out how, uh, how they think uh, and, and, and what their concerns are and um, not um, to perhaps trust too much um, the, the people, that are, our peers, our friends, and everyone who agrees with us. Um, if, if there was one uh, interesting, uh, I think, uh, uh, comment that came up time and time again in the referendum uh, context is, you know, uh, nobody I knew voted leave, or nobody I knew voted remain. And I think that's, that's quite interesting of how that and a kind of a solidarity and the kind of identity function uh, works. And I think if, if we want to really understand uh, our society better, then I think we have to really engage more properly with all these different contradictory uh, perspectives, but do that on the, on the, on the basis of respect. So thank you very much. for a brilliantly uh, rich and insightful lecture and a very complimentary analysis in your response, Christoph. We have about 10 minutes for discussion and questions, so um, I'll invite people to either, it doesn't have to be a question, it could just be a comment, or if they want to ask a question, ask a question. I'm conscious Jonathan might want to come back on some of the things that Christoph said as well, but... Um, Brave person there at the back. We have a roving mic so we can hear you. Hello. Okay. So, uh, I was very interested in the comments you had on social media and the internet. And uh, going by what's been happening in the past, where the mainstream media had a lot of grip on the narrative and the control and the facts that people hear, and how the internet has given them has given people a different avenue to pursue their facts and share their stories. Uh, you mentioned before about regulating some aspects of the internet, regulating some aspects of uh, social media, and I know Theresa May has been found that as well. Do you think that the internet or social media should be regulated or censored or controlled in some way to stem the tide of fake news or post true facts? Is that to me? Uh, yes. Do, do, you can take a group of questions, or do you want me to respond to that? Should we take a couple of more know. questions? Guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they won't hear at the back if you shout, even if you shout. There's the mic coming. Um, you didn't mention uh, contem contemporary religion as a possible on these problems. But I wonder whether you think that the fact that in our society there are people who hold very strongly incompatible beliefs, different religions or religion or atheistic beliefs or whatever, which other people regard as faith, might contribute to the issue of, well, with the issues that you were talking about. I mean, if you take creationism and evolution, for example, or incompatibility of different faiths. We'll take another one there and then. Hi, hi. also on the internet. Um, you mentioned that uh, the big tech companies have our interest and force you to you know, uh, have you know, dialogue and have a good career with you. But, but perhaps there's a place for tools that, that make it easier to find the truth and make it easier to. to as you say, the exchange views with people who don't share your views, um, the, the swipe left and right, the, the ponder of things are good at. And, and I, think, I believe there is a single uh, Reddit group that does that, a single kind of thing, change my view of government. Mm. Um, but I wonder if you can explore that. Are there, are there technological tools that could improve the situation? Would you like to take this? Sure. Um, so I think you're, you're the, that last question and the first one I'll, I'll take together because I, I don't think, I, if I did mention regulation, that was certainly not my intention. I'm not a fan of doing it that way at all. Uh, rather, it is using our power as citizens and consumers and users of these services to demand that they 
do a better job. And you know, we, we, there is some consumer pressure. Facebook are, is a very odd uh, organization in terms of what it responds to and what it doesn't, but they don't like being at the center of the story. And they do you know, those cases where they weirdly were posting videos of beheadings and, and yet wouldn't allow pictures of a mother breastfeeding a child. You know, weird community standards. Uh, they can respond to pressure. So I don't think they, I want Theresa May regulating the internet. She's got enough to do, I think. Um, so I, I can't imagine that working out, but rather exactly the kind of thing you're talking about of using tools and, you know, you know it's not beyond them. They're very capable people running those. Uh, the, just to refine the point about the algorithm, I, I perhaps didn't put it as clearly as I should. As I understand it, what it does is it, whatever you, it thinks you read, it serves you more of that. So it's constantly reinforcing. We think you like this view, we're going to give you more of that. That view and that's the thing that could be tweaked and I liked as you did the uh, Armando solution about being exposed to uh, people with other views I, it just gives me a chance to respond to the thing that Christoph said about we should you know get out more and get into more into the real world and find out what they think people who don't agree with us just a sort of comic observation on that after the uh, referendum and also actually an equivalent thing happened in, in the United States after the Brexit, uh, the Trump election, there was this sort of self-flagellation that consumed all journalists where they thought, we've got to get out of our bubble, we've got to go to, you know, in, in, in Britain, every, every journalist was going permanently to sort of Hartlepool and Grimsby, and in America it was Ohio and, uh, uh, and Michigan, etc. In 2017, nobody sent reporters to Kensington right, or Canterbury, to talk to all the students in Canterbury, if you'd suggested in the Guardian newsroom, I think I'm seeing on my Twitter feed a lot of really strong pro-Corbyn feeling in Canterbury among all the students. Should we do a piece on that? Everyone would have said, no, you've got to go to Harleypool to talk to all those Leave voters. And as it was, it meant you missed what was going on inside your own bubble, which was sort of comic because you're always fighting the last war. So actually, you know, sometimes you're, so, you're thinking, we've got to talk to people who are not like us so much that you end up missing what was going on in the, in the Trump case. Uh, the American media, where it fell down actually, was not that it failed to talk to those blue collar workers in towns where the factories are shut. You couldn't move for pieces about those people. What it missed was affluent suburban, particularly college educated white women who everyone thought was going to go for Hillary Clinton didn't. I mean, they did, but not in anything like the numbers they were expected to. So actually, a few more interviews with sort of the very people that you'd have said were just in the bubble would have told you what was going to happen in that election. So it's not as straightforward as always just get out more and see people who are not like you. Actually, you need to have 360 degrees of vision on this, but no to regulation and just more to them changing the apps. I could say something about this religion. Uh, in my experience, that is not where the battleground is. I mean, obviously, there's huge discussion around Islam and there's Islamophobia right, that, you know, is really runs rife online but you know when you mention creation and evolution that, that, to me the big battles are over huge battles about gender massive sort of misogyny issues online obviously but over leave and remain and over Trump and I hadn't seen it particularly about the, the, the problem was one of religious arguments I think people are in these silos that are political but it's you know you give me something to think about and I'll have another look is that what you meant no, I meant more that if you have a society where people believe something and other people think it's fake, then it must undermine the faith one side or the other in the, in the sources of those views. I see. People with certain very strong religious points of view, for example, there must be undermining their faith in you know, the faith of your and yes, I see. Credibility well, it's certainly the case that people hold to their views, and I think Christoph made this point, it was quite good, that when you attack them, they feel as if you're attacking them somehow and their identity. Uh, and yet we have to have a commonly agreed set of facts around it. So, you know, the actual measurement of the ice that's melted this summer, we, sh we have to be able to agree on that figure. And then, you know, if they want to, they, somebody can say... Nigel Lawson can say there's nothing to do with climate change. Everyone else can say it is to do with climate change. Religious people can say Noah's Ark is coming back. Whatever. But we've got to have the number in front of us. And where I worry is there's an attack even on the commonly agreed set of facts that we... And, and even the notion that there could be a commonly agreed set of facts. And that was why I mentioned the point about Trump cutting the office of the census and the way he talks about the what we would call the civil service as if they're partisan. That's a real problem. If you make everybody a partisan, then suddenly nobody is, uh, you can't, there's no referee on the pitch. Let's we'll take a couple more questions. So there's some here. Okay, we'll take that one there and then there's a couple here. Hello. Um, first of all, um, thank you for the 
the talk that you just gave me, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, so this is two quick questions for all three of you. Uh, first of all, in what we refer to today as a post-truth and fake news, how do we distinguish that historically from a long history of, say, governments and media sources giving misinformation about <coughs> For example, one of the things that you mentioned, Jonathan, was the blood libel movements that's been used to justify centuries of anti Semitism. How do we distinguish between these things in history that very much in their form seem exactly what we're talking about today? So, what's new today that sort of always happening? And the second question is how do we all feel about the Orwellian concept of double think in relation to thinking that something is true while at the same time also believing it to be false? Thank you. Thank you. A couple of questions down here. Thank you both. I haven't, I haven't necessarily got, it might become a question, but neither of you mentioned the thing that concerns me most, which is about the reporting of um, immigration and the feelings around immigration, because that, that speaks a lot to what you both said. So I work with people in Sunderland who you know, feel certain things about immigration and f have certain facts that they see as facts and my friends and I feel all sorts of other things about how positive immigration is and we have our facts and all that. And I work in education which is partly about dispelling myths but also the harder thing, addressing the feelings because you can dispel fact myths and still people are left with their feelings about immigration. So I just wonder if you had anything to say about that question be grateful. Yeah, I do. Is there someone just behind you? Yeah, um, yeah I'm just, um, my question is regarding, as, as, an as an audience, we just want to be exposed to different side of stories, um, especially after now, uh, like Russian Today, Press TV has the, actually has the channels to broadcast their perspective in English. And as an audience who wants to be exposed to different side of story, how do we choose wisely? Because they can easily say that Russian media is a propaganda and at the same time they can say that RT and press TV is just you know propaganda tool from the, their government but how do we decide which media is like because both of them I think provide enough facts and they have different completely opposite sides of story it's just mm. whether or not how, how we decide thank you so just take one more and then we have to make that the last Thank you. Um, following on more from what Christoph said about the erosion of trust in institutions, um, we're nearly 10 years on from phone hacking, 30, 40 years on from Hillsborough, and still you have a sense that the, the print media is, cannot just by doing what it does well overcome that negativity? How do institutions go about regaining trust and trustworthiness? That is a big question. Mm. So just do your best. Such interesting questions as well. Um, OK, I'm going to do my, I'll go through them more or less as we got them, I hope. Um, what you asked what was different about fake news uh, then and now, and I, I, I was the one who described the blood libel as an example of fake news. So I think absolutely these things have a long lineage. I think the thing I was suggesting that was different was this notion of even the audience not caring whether it was true. Now, I don't know what public opinion in Norwich made of the William Norwich story, but I think until, it, it feels to me as if it's a, a, a new, it seems to me, it's a new phenomenon, this idea of the public itself being agnostic about the truthfulness of something, that that's being secondary as a quality. But look, that may have an earlier history too, but, uh, but the, the other things that would make it different now are all these accelerants in terms of the technology and the media, etc. But it seemed to me important that my example was, you know, Nixon versus Trump. Nixon tried to seem truthful because he thought that his audience would think it important that he be telling the truth. Trump seems to be complicit in an idea of who cares. So I think that was the distinction I was trying to make. As for double think, absolutely. And, and I mentioned my admiration for Matthew Dancona's book, uh, and he uh, references this final scene between Winston Smith and his interrogator, O'Brien, and the notion that you are the true loyalty means you can know something is not true and believe it anyway. And he holds up the number of fingers he's holding. I felt there was something in that when Sean Spicer said, here are these crowds, 
which one do you think is bigger? And he was almost saying to his supporters, you know that crowd is smaller, but I want you as loyalty to Trump to say it's bigger. And the Trump hardcore supporters said so. And people, my, the, the sources I would go to in the current period, goes a bit to your RT point, are people who lived under authoritarian regimes. The best writers at the moment on Trump are people who lived in form, the former Soviet Union. Uh, Masha Gessen and Yesha Munk and various people write brilliantly on this. They said it was very deliberate. The people in power wanted you to believe the lie because that was an act of control. And Trump has those authoritarian instincts. So he tells deliberate lies as a test because if you accept it, then I know you're truly loyal. So I think the double think thing is really important. Um, feelings about immigration, absolutely important. The, the, the Remain side erred by, somebody would say, I feel as if my town has changed, and they would say, but you do know GDP has increased by 2.6 billion. You know, that is not the right way to argue that. Uh, instead, you have to speak, that's why I said there about we have to speak in the same sort of idiom and the devil can't have all the good tunes if somebody if somebody's coming to you with an emotional argument they don't want a you know laundry list of facts they want another emotional argument back i think i think as you do that there is a case for immigration that can be made that is very emotional you know and you go back to the danny boyle opening ceremony of the london 2012 olympics that was an emotional case that was made for a diverse plural society it wasn't a, a you know a recitation of facts but you have to be able to do that and partly it is about listening to um the st testimony that's been given to you so in a way you know somebody who wanted to be pro free movement when they heard people in rochdale for example, saying that they felt that their town had changed, it was to ignore them to come up with a whole list of proposals about the minimum wage, which is what I think Gordon Brown did and Ed Milliman did. And actually, although he, interestingly, hasn't been challenged on that, I think there wasn't much different in what Jeremy Corbyn was saying. But that message is not to, it's, it's apples and oranges. Someone's talking to you about apples and you're replying about oranges. So you have to be able to speak in the same language. I think it's an argument that can be won, but it's, it has to be conducted emotionally. Your very good question about BBC, you know, the somebody, a Russia Today viewer, would say, well, the BBC is propaganda as well. What's the difference? And they would say the same about press TV in Iran. Uh, and I was scribbling down a whole lot of different things about, you know, there's democratic governance here and there's authoritarian regimes there and you can get rid of the people. The real test is, do you ever see anything on Russia Today that would discomfort Vladimir Putin? Question. Do you ever see anything on the BBC that would discomfort Theresa May? Question. I think the answer to the second one is yes, and the answer to the first one is no, and that is the test. That's how you know whether you're watching a propaganda channel or not. Do you ever see anything on press TV that the uh, supreme leader would dislike? I think the answer is almost certainly no. That tells you it's a propaganda channel. The BBC, as we know from today, is constantly doing things that the, you know, the state doesn't like, and that puts the lie to the idea that it is some sort of state-run broadcaster. That's the only test that counts, is the quality of its output, and I think it passes that test. Uh, how do institutions regain their trust, uh, public trust? They've got to continue doing what they do, they're doing. The transformation in the perception, and, and Christoph was absolutely right, I was talking about the highest end of the, of the media, but when I mentioned uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and you know, I would like to think the Guardian. Uh, but the, the, the transformation in the perception of the mainstream media that has happened just in the last six months with the work of the Washington Post and New York Times is huge. Uh, you know, I don't think they've been as well thought of uh, as they are now since probably Watergate in terms of the perception of them as people who are holding power to account. It wasn't that long ago that there was the Jason Blair scandal at the New York Times when the guy was a, you know, a fantasist, the Janet Cook scandal at the Washington Post, a reporter actually very similarly making up things. Now they're at a point where they are seen as the people who are shining the light in the darkness. You know, that has happened because they have done the work. So for journalists, all we can do is keep on doing the work, but I would suggest as well that readers have to, have, you know, um, be open to the idea that what they're hearing they can trust and that it also, as, and this was, um, gives me a chance to say something about what Christopher was saying, he's absolutely right that the high end is fine, the local and others are really, really struggling. To, to which my response would be, but the solution to that is more funding and more journalism. It's not like there's something wrong with the journalistic model. The problem is in those local cases, there's not enough of it. Uh, the, you know, the answer, I always say the answer to almost any question in journalism is more reporting. To the, the answer to any question in this area of truth, I would say, is more journalism, and that requires funding. And we are all going to have to get used to something we're not used to here, Americans actually are, which is putting our hand in our pocket and paying for it. And the, the problem with the online era is, and 
publishers are absolutely to blame for this. We have sort of educated the public to believe this stuff comes for free. It doesn't, you know, to put dozens of reporters on uh, Trump's business links with Russia requires people and that costs money. And um, people are, we are all going to have to get used to the idea that if we want a free press and therefore a free society and a truthful society, we may have to pay for it. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to take any more questions, but Christoph, did you want to answer anything just very quickly? Yeah, perhaps uh, a couple of very quick quick points. Um, I, th I think w one um, what is, to, to the question of what is really new. I think one of the one of the things that is really new is now uh, that uh, we have uh, the, the spread of uh, uh, technology has enabled individuals to access their own information, and, and search engines, for instance, are now uh, more trusted than traditional media as a provider of information. So if citizens now increasingly look for search engines and social media as sources of information, that is, I think, a very interesting, uh, interesting and in some ways worrying change because, again, there's the question of do search engines give you high quality information? Mm -hmm. um, if they don't give that information, is there, uh, is there a question over tweaking the algorithms or even deciding that, this is, um, that these uh, search engine providers should look at themselves as journalists, as media companies, and should apply editorial standards as media companies do? Following on from that, I think there's a, a big issue around, um, you know, in, in terms of what can be done, uh, the degree to which uh, social media, search engines, Google, and so forth, are parasitic on the content that is provided by journalism. And I think they are. And if that is the case, then there's a question of whether they shouldn't um, uh, be taxed in some ways. And, and, and some of the revenue that they generate should be um, channeled into kind of high quality, uh, high quality journalism. Um, perhaps uh, lastly, a question over um, what are the causes of, of trust and distrust. I sometimes wonder whether today's politicians are uh, any less uh, um, are, are living uh, up to lower standards than politicians 30 years ago, or whether our standards of you know, our expectations of standards in public life have not been rising? And um, I, I sometimes get the impression that um, the media and, and po po politicians, the media, the political system, are in some sort of vicious circles where they are constantly kind of battling with each other, and as a result, kind of dragging each other's reputation down. Whereas perhaps in, in reality, there isn't actually a deterioration of standards. There's just a kind of a, um, a tendency towards criticizing each other uh, and perhaps not um, recognizing enough that, well, sometimes government is actually doing quite an important job and is most of the time perhaps doing a good job. But um, in two words, we might, we might accept yeah. Trump is my two words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On, those, on that note, <laughs> I'm going to call this part of the proceedings to a close. There will be drinks that I hope you'll join us with at the back. And it just leaves me to say a very, very big thank you to Jonathan for a characteristically, brilliantly insightful lecture, a fantastic analysis of the issues, but also thank you for giving us some solutions and giving us some hope. Um, then you've given us some very practical things that we can go away and do, like subscribe to The Guardian. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for that. And thank you, Christoph, as well, for your wonderful response. And we have a little... Ooh. <laughs>